this uh, this is an overview of uh, essentially the conversations we are having in our little team with Stephen, uh, Andrews, and Lei Wong, um, and some some of our uh, graduate colleagues. Um, the idea of uh, taking on a dynastic view is is uh, I think not as deep as the one you just uh, heard, but uh, it, it is a certain, certain uh, aspect of the joint distribution of outcomes that I think uh, is much more profitably, uh, usefully viewed as, as, a, as a sort of a dynastic uh, outcome. The, the other uh, issue that invites the dynastic view, I think, is this mutuality of the benefits uh, most of the, especially the modern uh, intergenerational mobility, seems to be asymmetric in its view of there was there were parents, there was a generation, and now let's look at the somewhat disjointed outcome for the for the children, for the offsprings, and see in what sense they are connected or causal. Uh, um, the uh, this mutuality encourages us to look at uh, uh, dynasty, the dynasty as the two generations for our purposes, the, the parents and offsprings. Uh, I'm going to emphasize a lot in this talk uh, the, the centrality of this joint distribution of outcomes. The outcomes could be anything, not just uh, uh, incomes or wealth. Uh, and uh, a separation of this, this joint outcome into marginals parents and offsprings, and this dependency structure, sort of like copular thinking, uh, it's, it's helpful to see what different measures are doing and or not doing or what they're missing in terms of discussions, in terms of capturing mobility. Um, so an essential part that uh, I'm hoping to help expose uh, in, in, this, in this overview is a is a better grip on what is actually mobility. What's good about it? Uh, I started looking at these issues in the early '80s, and at that time, panel data studies were dominant in terms of what mobility meant. And being an information theory kind of guy, I realized it's all about variance, and I wasn't sure why high variance in terms of income levels was necessarily a good thing. So I began to think in terms of welfare theoretic foundations. Uh, I was also in an environment with uh, uh, some theorists, uh, Tony Atkinson, Tony Sharks, and some of the people present here, Gary and, and Stephen, uh, uh, who thought in terms of axioms, welfare axioms, in terms of how do you assess an estate, an outcome, uh, and 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 sort of expose, be very transparent about uh, what is good about uh, a particular outcome, whether it, you know we reported by inequality measures or mobility measures or other other indices. So to have some discipline is very difficult uh, uh, to talk about this field. Gary, I think some times ago, identified six different concepts of mobility. And he said there are 20 measures. I think it was being being very kind and very economical. There are millions uh, because of each family has many, many members of uh, mobility measures. So for me to an organizing way of thinking about it is to think of uh, growth and exchange components of mobility. And to put it in very simplistic terms, growth would be when all boats rise and fall. So average incomes go up or everyone's income goes up either by a percentage or a level, uh, depending on what kind of movement we care about. The other is exchange, and exchange is sort of the inequality aspect. Uh, it involves both what happens to the dispersion inequality aspects of each of the marginals, but also the transition, the way we go from one marginal to the other. And this has been a sort of a central topic in the study of tax progressivity. Uh, in terms of what kind of tax system we have, what kind of transition, the process itself as, as an aspect of mobility. And uh, one message is that there is going to be no single measure of mobility 
uh, that we know of that would capture all of these. Um, in a way, we have everything in front of us as a joint distribution, but it's the indices from it that lack or fall short of trying to characterize it. So uh, one uh, message from uh, this, I hope it will come out, uh, it's apparent, I'm sure it's apparent to most of you, is to, to put in place in context the, the, the position of these IGEs, international uh, uh, intergenerational elasticities that dominate the current literature as uh, either correlations uh, or, or experiments, uh, rank correlations, they are seen to be a, a very special aspect of measuring uh, mobility and probably not the most important one uh, either. So uh, putting that into context is something I hope uh, this conversation uh, will, will help to, to, to establish. Uh, so the central object is this equation one, the joint distribution of outcomes. And here I've picked two outcomes which are popular. It could be permanent income of children, YC, and permanent income of the parents. And uh, suggestively, given the technology that we hope to use and we are using uh, and, and, and uh, is econometric and policy uh, suggestive and useful, is to show that this joint distribution uh, can be written in the familiar form of the conditional distribution of the offspring outcome, given all that matters. All that matters could be parental uh, incomes or out outcomes, and X's, the experiences, the covariates that rep represent the experiences of really both generations, possibly cut in terms of those for the children and those for parents, if they are indeed, indeed separate, different. This joint distribution as a central object is, is very useful to sort of organize both theoretical thinking, but also inferential thinking and measurement. Think of uh, this V uh, object index um, or any function uh, that you might choose to represent, to, to quantify your notion of mobility. Uh, whatever this V might be, it is a functional of that joint distribution. The asymmetrical ones uh, are functionals of the conditional distribution. The symmetrical ones will be directly a functional of the joint distribution without any, any symmetry. And if one thinks of two possible uh, uh, points to compare, F might be what is actually observed of a given population, G might be another population, or more importantly, in terms of measures of mobility, G could be reference that defines total mobility or immobility. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little, a little bit more about that. The thing is, given these two contrasts or multiple sets of contrasts, uh, the difference between them is merely a difference of these functionals of interest to you. Um, more broadly, uh, you think of uh, this omega as outcome of interest in, for, for offsprings, for instance, for time period t plus one. And it has, uh, in the course of generation t, uh, experienced this trajectory of disease and there could be multiplicity of these. Sometimes we can handle these uh, more easily than others, uh, empirically speaking, econometrically speaking. And so what we are typically interested in, it kind of relates to part of what Stephen was talking about, is that this outcome can be a function of these past trajectory of experiences and the stochastics. Uh, and an aspect of this relationship that is very interesting, for instance, in discussion of transition matrices, is this conditional probability uh, of the outcomes given those trajectories they can be used to characterize in an empirically useful way poverty sets uh, in terms of it, and once, you, once you define what the, what the ranges of those poverty sets are empirically, you can actually compute these probabilities and compare different populations with counterfactual ideals. So that, that, that can be done. Uh, the 
uh, workhorse of intergenerational mobility makes certain assumptions that allow a, a conditional mean regression. And so in the context of that joint distribution, you're talking about the conditional distribution of an outcome given another outcome and the conditional mean of that. And that could be in terms of log linear uh, relationships, either for levels or ranks. When they're in levels, we're talking about elasticities that are Pearson's correlation uh, has a lot of problems um, in terms of interpretability of what mobility is, or it could be in terms of ranks, uh, easier to interpret that those are experiments, uh, rank correlation, uh, limited, but um, in ways that are more technical than, than, than conceptual. Uh, again, um, if one were to limit uh, to match of the current literature, one would merely take uh, permanent incomes. Uh, so some aggregation of those trajectories where both parents and, and children are being used uh, is a quite a challenging task. Uh, and then regressions are looked at between those permanent incomes. Models uh, typically flow from this and are variations to this that use the classic Becker and Tomes and the more recent attention that uh, people like uh, Stephen and Andros uh, are, are paying to this timing of these trajectories and their effects, uh, timings of investments and in terms of when they impact children. Uh, this, of course, has, has important precedence and in the work of uh, Kuna and Heckman uh, and uh, uh, work with uh, joint with Shanak and the most, uh, the, the latest that I have read is the uh, forthcoming, I think, come out publication by Carnero and, uh, and co-authors in the JPE that uh, looks at the trajectory of incomes in terms of permanent income and two of the three periods that go into computing it and is able to separate the impact of the timing of, uh, of parental income. On, uh, on children's outcomes, whether it be income or education or other, other possibilities. Um, so examples of things we can do with this joint distribution moving toward measures of mobility. One is, uh, I think, exciting work with the composition. The compositions are trying to, are obviously attempts to identify different sources of an outcome. So if you have an inequality measure, a mobility measure, want to see um, what parts are due to uh, structural effects, returns to skills, returns to those uh, uh, experiences. I, I talked about the axes and what parts are, are uh, uh, compositional in terms of the actual characteristics themselves. Um, and so many possibilities. So I just exemplify, uh, supposing that the the independence case, this G is where uh, you have what some people call total mobility, complete mobility, that the joint distribution is factored and, and that itself is a good reference point. And it can itself be decomposed into a conditional and a, a joint of parent income and the characteristics. Uh, here, there are a number of uh, counterfactuals that one could consider. One is a further independence of the influence of parental income and these axes. This is where the structural and, and composition effects may be separated out. Um, and one case would be uh, that if, if in fact this, this, these two inf influences are counterfactually seen as being independent, uh, one is looking at a case in which returns to offsprings don't depend on parental income and represent independent structural effects. Uh, these are, you would recognize generalizations of Oaxaca blinder type uh, decompositions, which they produced at the conditional mean. We are now able to do at the uh, full distribution of outcomes level. Uh, Scenarios in terms of counterfactual gains, structural A, 
combined with the composition of I, these are the two generations or states, and um, we, can, we can actually derive an estimate, identify these distributions at the aggregate level. Uh, so for instance, these conditional distributions can be estimated with uh, inverse probability methods or estimated by quantiles and inverted like uh, uh, Le Wang and I have done recently um, following many other people or the uh, recently uh, uh, produced distribution regressions methods by Chen Zukov and Fernandez Val and others uh, allowing us to estimate these conditionals uh, and marginals are of course in the usual way and then integrate out to get the marginals of outcomes because all the measures implicitly or explicitly are functions of the marginal distributions and how you integrate out the conditioning is where the counterfactual games can be played and identified. So limits, so, so we can do, in, in the example I just described, we can have an, uh, a composition effect derived by estimating different counterfactual distributions and a structural effect. And the total that you observe in any mobility measure could be actually in this nice additive way described as coming from different sources. Um, the limit to this is that this is uh, possible at the aggregate level. If you wanted to be um, more, more ambitious and go to covariate effects, covariate counterfactual effects, the sets of assumptions that identify these disaggregated decompositions uh, are rather challenging, they're not very uh, realistic. So we can do aggregate decompositions at not so much the covariate level uh, uh, counterfactual analysis. So just that was just a very a brief, uh, I'm sure, way too cryptic description of the types of econometric work that can be brought into discussion of uh, decomposition of sources of immobility or mobility. Uh, but what kinds of measures uh, are there and what do they mean? What does mobility mean itself? But um, there are really three sorts, three sets of things that go into defining an estate. One is the parental situation. The other is the offspring situation. By situation, I mean distribution of outcomes. The other is a combination of both the interrelationship, codependence between those two marginals, but also the process. And I think the, the, the paper by Stephen and, and uh, co-authors was addressing that. How, how, how do those outcomes come about? Uh, reminds me of the uh, 40s work of Gibrat and later Champernown and Sargon about diffusion processes. Um, learning about those is huge. This is actually a very important part of learning about the, the, the transition as a process because the process informs the policymaker. That's where they could, they could learn what kinds of things might be um, uh, effective. So this business of looking at what happens from one joint distribution to another um, is quite challenging because it has a growth component. Things, maybe everyone's situation doubles and the exchange component. Uh, the bad news, I think, I think I'm right in saying the bad news is most measures, um, most indices for various reasons abstract from the growth component. They're into ranks, they're into correlations. The copula doesn't care about if, if, if a country is twice as good as, as well off in one generation compared to the other. A lot of mobility measures can't pick that up. They are into correlations and into dependencies, into, into ranks. And it is very difficult to get into those because there are different aspects of um, movement. Um, there are horizontal and there are vertical movements, these, these positional changes. And some measures are, in, in, in inequality literature itself, 
much more capable of dealing with levels and intensity of movements. Others are merely uh, sensitized to movement in positions, ranks, um, and very difficult to come up with uh, those that combine everything. There is a multi-dimensionality uh, multi aspect to this. You think of the, the, the uh, trajectories I spoke about, they're multivariable. You think of just the parent's income over five, six, seven periods or his, his lifetime or her lifetime and the child is the same thing. And uh, one way to, to begin to think about that in terms of intergenerational mobility is how some of us handle this in terms of intergenerational, cross-sectional mobility. Uh, there are aggregation issues that are brushed oftentimes under the carpet by defining simple averages of incomes. Um, um, or averages of household incomes um, that miss out the finite substitutability of income over a person's life cycle, let alone between two generations. Some of those aspects were treated in this paper that I had in 86, talked with focus on multidimensional inequality, but its immediate use was in, 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 in intergenerational measures of mobility. Um, this 86 paper is known as a two-step method. I first aggregate outcomes and then talk about inequality of mobility in them. Sui is a brilliant paper, not very well known. It's a, it's a beautiful axiomatic treatment that is one step. What is a better multidimensional aspect of a distribution between two different states? We come to the same indices, funny enough, because aggregation is in, inevitable. Um, when you talk about scalar indices, uh, but but some of this is is actually very prospective in terms of what sorts of things we need to do to talk about intergenerational mobility. Um, give you a little bit more taste for what had happened before for intra cross section mobility. Uh, imagine n individuals uh, in the sample. In a, in a given population of, say, parents or children, they're observed over T periods, and that's what we call that the welfare matrix. Um, and imagine having aggregator functions, SIs, uh, for each individual. This could be permanent income, uh, not just the averages, linear averages, but much more complex uh, substitution. Uh, uh, patterns allowed in these aggregators. And then a measure due to Shorok's really with foundational uh, concepts going before him is one of inequality reducing measures of mobility. So the idea is you have to have some welfare function that tells you why is mobility good? Why is a certain movement good? And what we have in, in economics is increasing and concave uh, welfare function, utility functions. And those mean that more is better and we care about inequality. And so back to inequality measures as basically increasing one-to-one -one transformations of welfare functions. So, so this, is, this, this is a very welfareist, well-informed type of uh, uh, measure of mobility. What it does is compare the inequality measure, whatever measure you like, of these aggregates as the period of aggregation increases compared to a, a reference point in terms of short-term inequality, snapshot inequality, which could be defined itself as an average of short-term inequalities. What kinds of weights is, is, is crucial somewhat? Um, Shorrocks used uh, uh, average incomes for each, each period to do that. I've used other weights as well. Uh, in terms of inequality measures, um, I write this down to bring back a point I just made. If you note that this is, this is a generalized entropy, it's, it's really Atkinson's, a transformation of Atkinson's measures. You notice all the incomes, all the outcomes are uh, scaled by the mean. So these inequality measures are relative inequality measures. They don't care about levels. And that's, that's a common theme in a lot of uh, mobility measures explicitly or, or implicitly. 
closer to what we are looking at intergenerational mobility. Um, I'm borrowing heavily from this field of uh, tax progressivity and, and horizontal inequality. Um, if you think of uh, this very important correlation, this gamma function, it's a correlation between levels and ranks, the Fs being the CDFs, uh, between the two generations, uh, uh, parents and children, <clears throat> versus the same covariation at the base level. So it's asymmetric. And it's appropriate, I think, for the intergenerational mobility field, but one could easily make this uh, as a symmetric measure um, that is at the bottom of this page. I'll talk about these weights. Atkinson's measure is very similar. It's just a normalization of the same between two states. Um, and though I'm not spending time on them, they are really well-founded in terms of uh, welfare theoretic foundations. Um, relatively not well-known paper should be uh, is, is by Mervyn, the governor of Bank of England. Uh, he tried to combine horizontal movements and vertical movement considerations and uh, in an axiomatic way, but what might be good about movement from one state to another came up with mobility measures that are very similar to this Atkinson. Um, uh, Plotkin and others have produced the same types of uh, measures. Um, I'll try to say something about the connectivity or lack thereof between these and the current IGEs, it, uh, intergenerational elasticities. Um, a little bit about the properties of these, these measures. Um, I borrow a lot from Yechaki and Wudon um, when the weights or the Gini ratios reflecting Lorenz's status of these two states um, and what kinds of mobility uh, are inherent in these types of measures. Um, one is that if you take a deterministic non-decreasing relationship between the offspring and parental income, it is non-stochastic, um, it will give us uh, the minimum mobility, is the maximum immobility in the jargon of the modern international, I mean, inter intergenerational mobility. Um, that's when these two correlations become one, uh, both of them, um, and the as asymmetric ones become zero. The, um, the transition has not changed rankings. The IG mobility uh, becomes zero. Okay, uh, this is Shorrocks's concept of immobility. You notice it's not quite independence that dominates what is implicit in correlation measures or, or, or the Sperman's rank correlation. Um, the, for instance, you can have Pigou Dalton transfers that address intensity of inequality. They can reduce inequality in levels that leave the ranks unchanged and those will not be picked up by these measures. And so intensity of, if a policymaker were to hit their head and come up with decisions to, to uh, make transfers uh, like pure income uh, tax incentives or uh, provide uh, investment incentives in terms of college tuition, uh, debt forgiveness or, 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 or accounts, um, they may change the intensity of the inequalities, but they may not be picked up at all by a, a, a something like the rank measure. And they might wonder uh, whether the policy is effective or not. And so, so uh, it's, it's important what measure is being used to, to monitor the impact of, uh, uh, impact of policies. The growth component uh, is not, again, I emphasize taken into account in these measures because everything is relative. There is reason for this preference for relativity, both philosophically, well, for theoretically, but also in terms of our need to be scale invariant. We make transformations, we make inflation adjustments and so on, there are different periods in different countries. We need measures that are invariant that don't say things that are artifact of those transformations. So this invariance makes a lot of sense. 
But unfortunately, in the bargain, we lose the situations in which maybe everyone's uh, plight has improved or, or not, not, not improved. The maximum mobility, ironically, in these measures is kind of very different from correlation measures. Imagine, again, a deterministic relationship between children's outcome and parents that is non-increasing, the opposite. Um, in this situation, we actually get, with these measures, we get the maximum mobility. It's not the independence. And this is more, this is closer to Shorrocks' notion of uh, maximum mobility than independence that Praise and Hartley and others had, had, uh, had advocated. The, the, there is a paper actually developing under uh, this presentation. In it, um, I focus a lot on this um, uh, set of properties for, uh, for the in, uh, symmetric uh, inter intergenerational mobility measures that uh, really uh, uh, flow from the this correlation, the Gini correlation that you mentioned. It, it crops up everywhere. Um, and these properties uh, are quite revealing of what you might expect in terms of how you characterize the actual empirical data in a given setting, what to expect these measures to show and what, what they care about. Uh, oftentimes, um, what we find is that these measures pick up uh, high incomes and high incomes outcomes or in terms of a high or, uh, uh, quadrant correlations and low incomes and uh, low ranks. Um, and they tend to emphasize if there is there is there is a um, um, there is a situation that is more concordant than the other. They tend to to show greater immobility. This is what these 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 measures tend to be sensitized to. Um, let me skip over some of these in the presentation. I provided the presentation, happy to share it uh, later on. Um, a little bit more uh, uh, color to uh, what kinds of properties these measures have. One that I like to highlight is this exchangeability. It's somewhat connected to Stephen's presentation. Um, if the children and parents outcome distributions are exchangeable, essentially the same shape, um, then that's the that's comparable in terms of in uh, in terms of what is total mobility, uh, total immobility. Excuse me. Uh, it it compares to the case of total dependence when correlation measures are are being used. But notice that in nature they're very very different. This says no matter how you got there between two two different generations. If the two these marginal distributions are exchangeable or, or similar, uh, there is no mobility at all. Whereas there could have been quite a bit of mobility, especially in terms of intensity of inequalities. So um, the, the message is I'm being very critical in a way in terms of every every um, measure of mobility, what it might miss, what it might mean, what the maximum and minimum values are it are, and that's the nature of the beast. Whenever you have a matrix of outcomes, people and generations and time, indices aggregate. Aggregation has consequences, and there isn't a single way of aggregating. Every scalar measure must have aggregated, and these aggregations are done under with with great deal of restriction and and, and in terms of what they eliminate in terms of our consideration. The message is. One has to report all of them, but be very transparent about what they what they measure and what they do not measure. Uh, no single measure is going to be able to cut it. Um, if the scalar measures, it's a familiar theme in 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 my work, then um, means complete orderings 
of different inter intergenerational mobility states is not possible in a unique way. It's really a reflection of Arrow's result. There isn't going to be a unique uh, welfare functional that everyone will agree to. Here we have this additional problem. There isn't going to be a unique scalar functional of that stochastic outcome that is going to be agreed upon by everyone as, as uh, characterizing an outcome. So the question, the ambitious question is, can you avoid uh, scalar measures, any, any of these mobility measures, in comparing to separate outcomes? And that's a matter of partial orderings, uniform orderings over classes of utility functions, like, like stochastic dominance. In the multivariable setting that we're in, inevitably in, in um, intergenerational mobility, you're talking about um, multivariable stochastic dominance effectively. The way I go about it is first to highlight something that I think is very relevant to uh, intergenerational mobility. This concordance orders, concordance orderings are very revealing. The econometric work that is required is very much like the test for dominance that we already have in the literature. Uh, it's just that how these things uh, impart uh, an, an understanding of what is happening between the two distributions and how they're related to copulas, because copulas are the uh, basis for uh, rank correlations and correlation work in empirical work. So uh, first, in generality, supposing you have uh, uh, n generations in each dynasty, uh, could be, uh, I, I only have two in, 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 in my mind. Uh, the concordance ordering is that in a sense, F is better than G if the CDFs and the um, 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 help me out, I've forgotten the name for this, um, the F bar, it will come back to me. Um, it's, it's one minus F. Um, um, if this correspondence holds, you have a preference for F over, over G uh, in the two. Say it again. Survival function, is that what you're thinking of? Survival function, thank you. <laughs> Senior moments. Uh, it turns out that uh, you don't need this second condition because the second condition and the first imply each other in the, in the two generation case, father, son types of things. Uh, if you're just comparing uh, permanent, uh, permanent incomes. And that's the uh, uh, supermodular case, and that's relevant for our, our situation. It's, it's important to understand that if both inequalities hold, then large and small values will tend to uh, be more often associated with G, less mobility. G will be less mobile if you can empirically establish and test for these conditions and if they hold. If they hold, you, you will have found something your judgment of one situation being better than the other does not depend on what, which mobility measure. Um, still, these, as we will see in a moment, are avoiding um, gross component of mobility. These tend so to you've be- You've got about three minutes. Say, say it again? You've got about three minutes. I got cut off? Oh, got three minutes? Yeah. Okay, all right. So I, I connect these rankings to uh, to uh, copular rankings. The connectivity is from a scalar's uh, theorem. So you can, instead of having those rankings between the CDFs, you can actually have the rankings in terms of the copulas. And um, the copulas uh, are a much more general uh, notion of immobility that do not require linearity of the relationship between parent and uh, offspring income. Um, the, there is econometric work available and routines to actually do this test for, for copular uh, rankings. And one would quickly be able to uniformly uh, rank either real life situations or counterfactuals, uh, which, which I spoke about. 
what I'm excited about is this guy. You can write from that same scalar theorem the joint density of the outcomes, the two of them in our case, as the copula density plus the product of the marginals. Product of the marginals is the independence, total mobility situation. If in your mind's eye, if you divide both sides by this independence case, you have the actual distribution divided by the counterfactual independence. That's copula, mobile, that's copula density. That's the most fundamental uh, object in information theory. Everything we say about distributions and joint outcomes has to do with this, in fact, expected value of log of this ratio is kullback libler But more interestingly, that means that the entropy of the copula density is in a way everything you would want to know in a relative sense about intergenerational mobility. So if I look at the entropy of the copula density, and that's certainly for two dimensions very easily estimated non-parametrically, I have access to all manner of old-fashioned inequality measures. Entropies are inequalities. Tiles, tiles inequality measures will have those beautiful decompositions by population subgroups and by characteristics now immediately become available uh, because we're looking at the entropy of the copula. But one last mention, we are still talking about copula and it misses out on intensities and growth components of mobility. To capture that, we need to compare entire distributions in terms of their dominance for different uh, dynasties in different uh, countries. This kind of dominance, not based on copula, but the joint distribution, harks back to work that uh, Atkins and Bourguignon in particular started off. Um, these are, in the case of second order dominance in particular, they do uh, contain the growth component. So you can have inequality increase, but if the l average level of uh, uh, well-being has increased, income has increased, you can have dominance no matter what the measure of uh, mobility one has. But the two combined would mean uh, tests for stochastic multidimensional dominance of one dynastic outcome with the other. Routines are available. Wong's uh, beautiful textbook has it all in terms of conditional testing routines in R and MATLAB and, and uh, combined with what we can do with conditional distributions now in terms of uh, recovering counterfactuals. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be able to look at the distribution of outcomes and look at dynastic as producing different uh, distributed outcomes. That's, I think I'll stop right there. Yeah, say thanks so much. Um, comments, questions, or? Um, I have a question. Um, do, do you know any empirical papers on intergenerational mobility where um, ideas involving copulas are pushed further than a simple footnote? It, I, that, that's an excellent question. That uh, they, There isn't much. There is, I, I know that in the, in the current uh, papers by Chedi and others, copulas are acknowledged, but it's still people uh, talk about the IGE, the, the correlations. Right. Much of the characterization of the empirical literature and its findings are in terms of those same correlations. Um, an opportunity for me, copula is a distribution it itself has to still be characterized. We need the metric. That's why I suggested the entropy, because we have a distribution. We can rank it, but if you wanted to characterize by a scalar, one would need to still find a scalar to characterize the copula. And I, th I can't think of a better measure than entropy. So it will tell us, uh, for instance, if flat uh, entropy is maximum intergenerational mobility. And we know how to do that, but to your point, 
it's not done. That's part of our, our uh, project uh, in our team. We've already got some computations using a Hellinger measure. Tiles measure, tiles measure is just Shannon's entropy. It's not a metric. So we are doing that because we think hasn't been done and, and it, would be, it would be informative. I see, thank you. I, I would be happy if you can share your presentation. And Happily. References. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>